<laughs> All right, I'll, I'll do it for the, we're going to make it. This is the, the title of the topic, Improving the Academic and Career Outcomes of Black Men. So I'll go ahead and I will start with the learning objectives. Right now, uh, what we're going to learn today is really to know the current status of Black males and the barriers to their academic and career uh, success. I also want to talk about two qualitative studies. I know qualitative studies and limitations is really just the context in the case, but I think a lot of us will really understand, uh, especially the Black men in the room and even myself, some of the experiences that they may have gone through. So I think it's uh, worth noting to discuss their experiences through that uh, research lens and also giving recommendations of how to improve the academic and career outcomes for uh, Black males. Uh, one of my favorite books is The Envy of the World on Being a Black Man in America by Ellis Coast. And one of the quotes that always seems to strike me is, being a Black man in America has never been easy. It certainly wasn't for our forefathers. Yet at a time when the entire race, entire might of a race-demented society conspired to destroy their dignity, millions managed to hold their heads high. They refuse to allow their humanity to be stripped away. So the reason why this really strikes a chord to me, because if you think about a lot of the uh, Black men, you think about the, a lot of the narratives you actually see on TV around uh, uh, engagement around the police, kind of the negative stereotypes of Black men, we still somehow are resilient. We're still sitting in spaces here today as faculty members, as doctors, lawyers, uh, being able to be politicians as well. And the other piece is that through that process, a lot of Black men has, have had their intellect questioned, never getting the benefit of the doubt, <laughs> always being questioned to see whether they're right or wrong. But yet we seem to have the most cheer and jeer when it comes to sports and entertainment. So everybody watched the Super Bowl, I, I presume. We're in a football town. We're actually in the football a football state. So I know a lot of folks are celebrating some of the individual players, but that same celebration doesn't necessarily translate when you see men in academic and scholarly spaces or in professional leadership spaces. We can even talk about some of the microaggressions we've seen with President Barack Obama when he was actually in office. So this is one quote that always says that, you know what, Black men continue to be resilient in the face of opposition, in the face of hardship. And on top of that, some of them have family, some of them have siblings, mothers, fathers. So still having to deal with the normal day-to-day -day life in terms of moving forward with life. As my students say, life be life in. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about my career journey, because as a researcher, I'm normally the research instrument. A lot of the qualitative folks in the room will say they're the instrument. So I want to talk about myself being an instrument today. So I'm a homegrown Florida man. I'm from Tampa, Florida, graduated from Brandon High School, uh, went to community college. I'll talk about that in a second. But in addition to that, ended up coming here as an alum. And in fact, those two years are probably one of the uh, transformational years of my life. I was introduced to an organization that used to be here called the Brothers of the Academy, I had a lot of mentors, and that really propelled me to go into uh, getting a PhD. I just thought I wanted to be a school counselor, make some good money, go back home. Or At the time, I wanted to move to Orlando and say, my life can be a vacation. I can go to work, and then I can go to Universal and Disney. But life was life, and, and I ended up taking another turn. I also went to William & Mary and got my master's degree in school counseling, and then ended up going to the University of Maryland and attaining my PhD in counselor education with a focus in urban education. But before all of this happened, before you all see the person that is standing before you today, I struggled in high school. I, I made pretty good grades in elementary school. I made pretty good grades in junior high school. It was junior high school back then. I'm dating myself. I know it's middle school now. However, when I got to high school, I was just disengaged. I really didn't, how can I say it? The work didn't interest me at the time as a sophomore, as a 10th grader. Um, 
I was actually accused by several teachers of doing some things that I didn't do. And I think at one point I'll share this story. I was taking driver's ed. That's when they had driver's ed back in high school. And a, a, a classmate of mine who happens to be a black male as well was in the car with me. And we got out of the car. We had to park the car, go back to the class, X, Y, Z. And then the teacher came in and asked us, why did we turn on the radio? And we said we didn't turn on the radio. And we were pretty adamant about it. But he gave us an F anyway and said, you all turned on the radio. So these are some of the experiences that, as I think back and why, I'm, why I am where I am today, kind of fueled me to do the work in which uh, I am engaging in. So part of that kind of, uh, I think, took some of the air out of my balloon. I didn't really get back engaged into high school until probably the spring of my 11th grade. But by then, I failed a few classes. I went to mandatory summer school for the first time. And once you apply for college, your 12th grade year, those sophomore grades are hard to bring back up your senior year. So at the time, in my truth, I wasn't even eligible go, to go to a four-year public school in the state of Florida because I didn't have the requirement. So I went to community college. I still failed some classes. I thought it was uh, 12th grade, but Hillsborough Community College was the best thing that happened to me. Uh, I decided to go to a campus that had an environment in which I could thrive, more students of color, more faculty of color. They also had uh, white faculty as well who were very uh, culturally sensitive and responsive. The first campus I went to didn't really have that there. And so with that, uh, I decided that, hey, uh, I wanted to help other young men and other students who have came in to come through the path like me, maybe non-traditional, made some mistakes in life to be able to get back on track. So at the age of 19, I decided that's why I wanted to go into school counseling. So with that being said, all of that is culminated today into saying, hey, my research is really focusing on how do we train school counselors and other educators, but also uh, faculty and staff and administrators at the higher ed level. How do we best work with Black males? Because sometimes we're quick to dismiss our Black men for one mistake as opposed to understanding that, hey, nobody's perfect, particularly when they're young and they're in their developmental stages. They make mistakes, but we can always correct them. So with that being said, that is kind of why I got into where I am today and the research that I'm doing. And in particular, when we talk about college and career readiness, we all need more money, right? Degrees, high school diploma, post-secondary education usually leads to an increase in income a quality of life that is much better. So I wanted to ensure that, hey, this is the path that we need to ensure that all of our young men are going on. Whether they get a four-year degree, four year degree or not, they get a two-year degree or a certificate, just ensuring that they can climb up that career ladder. So my academic journey actually translated into my career journey. I was a counselor uh, in a gifted and talented school for a few years. I was actually a counselor, too, for the Ronald E. McNair Post-Baccalaureate Achievement Program. For those of you who don't know, it is a TRIO program that is geared towards getting first-generation students and underrepresented students in PhD programs, actually in a PhD program, to get a PhD. Also served as a college and career readiness coordinator for Urban School District, where we work with middle school kids to get them interested in post-secondary opportunities. That really included taking them to uh, different universities on campus, I mean, not on campus, in town, and also getting them interested in STEM and other majors. We were bringing guest speakers who were, do, who were doing some of the work. We were bringing in community members who were actually engaging with students on a day-to-day -day basis so that the students could actually uh, not only develop trust, but really understand that we're in there to want to improve uh, their lives. And then from there, I was an assistant professor of school counseling for a few years, and then I became an associate professor, was tenured at two institutions here, and then my institution previously at the University of Connecticut, uh, overseeing the school counseling program, and then coming here, uh, Damon, uh, Andrew, our dean, created the Elevate Ed initiative, and part of that initiative was relaunching the school counseling program, so I was hired to do that. And we relaunched it in an online format in which we get students from all across the nation wanting to 
come to Florida State to be the next generation of school counselors. So I thought about when I went into academia, that's the funny part. I didn't have a desire to do it. But when I actually went on the interview, I saw myself doing this at scale. So instead of me working in one school to help uh, school building the students, I can actually train hundreds, if not thousands of students to go into multiple school buildings to help hundreds of thousands of students. All right. And so the other part that was really a significant factor in my life as well is being able to create and design a living learning community for black males. And so this is kind of where I had a lot of political fodder coming at, out of my way. So some of the things we're seeing now uh, in our political landscape is not surprising. Been there, done that, wrote that book. And so with that, uh, developing a learning community, I actually got the opportunity to use data, collect data, but also advocate for Black men. I think one of the things when we talk about this work in research, can we really say, hey, uh, I want to help Black males. I want to do the work, but can we get in the trenches and do it on a daily basis? Can we actually show that we can do the work? And then even when the work is not popular and controversial, are we still dedicated to it? So for me, that was kind of showing, hey, I could do this. This is what I'm passionate about. And I was willing to put my career on the line for it because that's how dedicated I am to this work. And so the other thing I do want to mention once we get into some of the other work is that I do have two small black boys. So I know what it's like to be a parent. My wife can tell you as well. Uh, on a consistent basis to ensure and engage with their teachers on a consistent basis to make sure that they get all the adequate resources and the treatment needed to thrive in an educational environment. Some of my current projects, uh, I have two edited volumes coming out soon. Uh, one is with Black Males in STEM and a Journal of Women and Minorities in Science and Engineering. Another one is looking at the Black male experience through solutions in multiple contexts clinical community and school settings in the Journal of Counseling and Development. We also have a fourth uh, coming book. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Fletcher and I, uh, on Black males in secondary and post-secondary education, teaching, mentoring, advising, and counseling, which our own Dr. Christopher Small is an author in the chapter as well. I put him out there a little bit, talking about Black males and, and literacy uh, in our illustrious uh, ed policy at, uh, leadership department. So I want to uh, give him a shout out. Ed leadership and policy study, sorry, department. Uh, I'm also working on some funding uh, from the National Science Foundation with my colleagues, uh, Eddie Fletcher, who is from the Ohio State University. Uh, he's also in a career technical education and a, um, a, a professor there on uh, teaching strategies, uh, strategies to improve the recruitment and retention of black male STEM teachers and also serving on a panel for the work, What Works Clearinghouse on a guide on college and access uh, and readiness uh, for the U.S. Department of Education uh, and Institutional Education Sciences. Uh, Dr. Laura Perna, who's really big on college access, she is leading uh, the panel as well. So I wanted to kind of show you kind of all the work that I'm doing around Black males to further and advance the information and hopefully being able not only to just to get it out to higher ed, but also into public uh, and common spaces as well, so it could be reachable to the community. So I wanna get into the current status of black males. I think mean, one of the things that I love to show folks is all of this, oh, Eric, you're saying this, you're, you're saying this about black males, but is this really true? Well, then let's look at the data. We always wanna use data, right, to drive the interventions and to drive the policies that we need to create to help, uh, in this case, a particular population. So as you notice, the high school graduation rate uh, is pretty good for black males, actually, uh, believe it or not. 91% uh, uh, white males is 95%, uh, Hispanic Latino is 73%, Asian Pacific Islander is 94.3%. Uh, However, although they may be doing well in high school, the question probably what we really need to ask ourselves is, are we preparing them for college? So they may be graduating from high school, but are they prepared for post-secondary opportunities? And so if we look at our national six-year graduation rate at four-year institutions, only under 40, a little under 40% of Black males are graduating at the six-year rate. 
And this has been steady probably over the last decade between 34, 39, 40% compared to white males, 64%, 54% for Latino males and 76% for Asian and specific Islanders. And so we'll drill down even more when we talk about STEM degrees. I know a lot of you all have probably heard, heard about weed out program, uh, weed out classes, which are really those introductory STEM courses that will get you into a STEM program, but it's survival of the fittest. Well, if you can't pass this class, then maybe you're not uh, fit to be an engineer or fit to be a chemist. And I've worked with a lot of students in that process so who had to deal with that and had to advocate for them. So if you look at the STEM bachelor's degrees, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, for those who uh, need to know what the acronym is, Black males are only graduating with 6% of the STEM degrees compared to 56% of white males, 12% of Hispanic and Latino males, and 13% of Asian Islander males. And then let's look at the unemployment rate of Black men. We have the highest unemployment rate, and this was just pulled, I pulled this from the first week of February, so this is the latest uh, information. 2.9% for white males, Hispanic, Latino, 4.3% and Asian, 2.8%. Uh, so if you notice, we have an employment problem, we have a degree problem, and we really have a STEM degree problem. So these are some of the issues that we have to think about when addressing this data. So for me, this has always been the red flags like I said, we, we could see, oh, we see enough, we got HBCUs, we see enough students, even at PWIs, black males, but we also have to drill down in the data to really give the story and paint where are the gaps and where do we need to plug those resources in. So I was circling back to um, that data, I want to talk about some of the barriers in K-12 settings that could hinder Black males from being college and career ready. Black boys are the least likely to be enrolled in any type of rigorous coursework, advanced placement, international baccalaureate, honors programs. And some of these programs are really dependent on whether teachers refer them to the particular class. So I want you to keep that in mind as well. But on the flip side, they're more likely to be in remedial courses, they're more likely to be in special education and not because of a cognitive uh, ability or a physical ability. They were usually referred to special ed because of behavioral issues. And so I wanna give some more context. If we look at the teacher workforce, over 70% of the teacher workforce are white, female, usually coming from suburban areas. You look at what well, most of our African Americans are in school, particularly in the South, it could be in urban and rural areas. We have a huge Black rural population in this area in particular, North Florida, South Georgia, Alabama. But up North, most of them will be in urban areas. And so the teacher demographics are mirroring and looking the same. So clearly there is a mismatch in culture and a mismatch in understanding. They're also more likely to be expelled or suspended. So when you're expelled or you're suspended, what usually happens? You, you don't have work at home. You're not learning, you're not achieving. The best indicator of academic achievement is attendance. So if they're the most likely to be expelled, then we know that they're gonna, it's gonna be gaps in their learning. Also wanna talk about adultification. So adultification is really a term that is used to look at a child more developed developmentally advanced than what they should be. Also looking at a child that could be larger than life or looking at them as superhuman, superhuman. So normally when we see black males, if they're not someone that we know, not someone that we're concerned, and I'm saying all just in general, not generalizing. Sometimes we look at them as being larger than life. My son is almost six foot tall and he's in 11th grade. I mean, he is in sixth grade and 11 year, an 11 year old. He could easily be mistaken for probably being a high school student at this point. He can also easily be mistaken for somebody who is doing something mischievous. So instead of maybe a demerit, maybe detention, if he talks back to the teacher, he's going to end up getting suspended because of how he looks, the way he looks, the way he may project his physicality. That's adultification. 
If you also see on some of the news, there's been some of the craziest stories about what happened to black boys in school. Uh, a few years ago, there was a teacher who made um, a black boy take his feces out of the toilet because he stopped up the toilet. The boy was in kindergarten, I believe, or first grade. How do, how do teachers think about black boys? Why would we make him do that? We wouldn't make any other student pull their feces out of the toilet. We would just go get a plunger and call it a day. So these are things that we have to think about when we're engaging with Black males across the lifespan. Prejudice and racism. I, th I don't think I need to say much about that. Well, I, I, will, I would, but we don't have enough time today. <laughs> <laughs> but back to that 39%. I want to also show you some of the barriers that go to uh, preventing our young men from being um, successful in post-secondary transitions, uh, post-secondary settings, excuse me. Uh, difficulty transitioning from high school to college. This is a, a big one. So normally we all are excited. I mean, I'm excited when, in the beginning of the school year. I know my last institution, I was working with freshmen. You see the freshmen coming on campus, uh, they're packing, unpacking, giving their parents a hug, or maybe not, trying to avoid pictures, uh, uh, seeing their new friends. But the other thing that we often forget if we're not really conscious in, in education or human development is that these young people only had three months to transition from being a kid in school to being an adult <laughs> in their freshman year. And so when they come to our classrooms, we're expecting them, well, you need to read the whole syllabus, you need to get on Canvas. If you're not reading Canvas, that's your fault. You need to come to office hours. If you're not coming to office hours, then that's probably your fault too. Whereas actually we may need to continue to coach them and help them transition successfully if they're not in a bridge program or early arrival program to really adjust and adapt. And some of the kids don't really understand how to adapt into their second semester. I know I was one of those in community college. So black males often encounter some of these transition issues as well, not knowing where resources are, not really wanting to talk to anybody. Well, if I talk to my professor and ask them when it's tutoring, they're gonna say I'm dumb or maybe they'll think that I wasn't listening when truthfully, I'm just nervous and I'm trying to figure out this whole college uh, process. The other thing that I do wanna talk about too is not studying effectively for our STEM courses, our introductory courses. And I learned this, as a faculty director uh, in my learning community at the time, is that you don't study calculus. You don't study a lot of these introductory STEM courses. You got to do it. You got to practice calculus. So I had a lot of students actually trying to study formulas instead of sitting there just practicing and doing it. And I had a, a calculus teacher who came in and said, Dr. Hines, I want to work with the kids in the learning community. I want to bring in the faculty members in their space to learn. So that gave them an opportunity to the kids or the young people to be themselves, to actually ask questions that they may be nervous about ask, asking in front of their classmates, and then also being uh, vulnerable to get it wrong. And so we saw a huge increase in a lot of our students passing introductory uh, calculus the first uh, go round. The other thing that we don't talk about too is a lot of black men are experiencing suicide, uh, higher suicide rates, mental health, anxiety, uh, depression, and some of these things play out differently. Some of them may end up wanting to have a gun, maybe be in an adverse situation. And so rather than maybe talking it out, they're getting into a situation where they end up wanting to kill themselves. So they get shot or they are walking out and they're leaving everything behind and saying, hey, I'm not dealing with my responsibilities. I'm going to sink and leave it at that. So sometimes we have to realize what does depression look like in black males? What does anxiety look like in black males? I can also tell you too, in a classroom, some of our kids who may have anxiety, who are stressed, who may not understand the lesson in a K-12 classroom, they'll say, Dr. Hans or Mr. Hans, I'm getting out of the classroom. I really don't care. I don't care about this class. So we think they're being rebellious, but they're really saying, hey, I may not understand the lesson, and I don't want to be embarrassed in front of my friends. And so the ego comes in and takes place. So these are things that we have to be aware of and that we have to acknowledge as opposed to thinking that there's that stereotype again, that but being macho, don't want to listen. 
it's really something that may be going on that is a red flag that we have to address. Other thing that I do want to talk about, too, is uh, the microaggressions. I talked about racism a little bit. But, you know, you come into college, you know, in your freshman year, you might be in a particular program that you came through that actually has high retention rates, that actually gets you the resources you need and you understand the resources in campus and being here in the summer. Oh, you came through XX program. You're just a quota. You really couldn't make it through admissions. It's a microaggression. That's somebody telling you, hey, you're not good enough to be here with in actuality, if you got admitted to the, the university, we're all good enough to be here. That's the equity piece. The equity piece is how do we give resources for students who may be lacking or have gaps that their other classmates may not have because they have the resources to bring them up to speed. So I'll leave, the, I'll leave it at that. And also uh, a clear path to graduate school. So I have a lot of students. In fact, I'm working with a student right now who he graduated with a 3.0 from uh, undergrad from a particular institution. He gave me a call and said, Dr. Hines, and he has some social anxiety issues. I picked that up uh, as well. I can't find a job or how do I apply for a job? or How do I talk to this person? And so we're working with him to get into graduate school. So yeah, it's one thing to get a degree, but let's talk about the career outcomes. Are we helping them get to the position and the careers or their career goals in which they set to uh, want to uh, achieve and aspire to. All right, so I'll talk about one of my studies, making sure I'm out for time. Paul, give me a few more minutes, please. <laughs> I'll, I'll speed up. Um, I want to talk about one of the studies here that um, this explored the experiences of Black males who were first-year college students in a a living learning community. So the study is already published. It is titled, You Are Going to School, Exploring the Pre-College Experiences of First-Year Black Males in Higher Education. So if you want to, just email me. I can send you that article um, if you want to, uh, if you want to read it. So this study is really about understanding uh, their pre-collegiate experiences and why did they decide to enroll in college? So I really want to talk about some of the strengths-based approaches of why these black males wanted to come to college and what was their decision. And also to understand some of the college and career readiness factors that came, uh, that came along with it. So I'm only gonna have a few slides uh, on this. So the findings, looking at the themes, the external influences of college expectations, what we would call pre-college primers, I'll explain that in a second, and educational and social empowerment. So the external, influences of college expectations were basically the factors that led them to attend college. And one of the factors was parental and family expectations. So Garrett Morgan, who we talked about, it was actually a participant, we had to disguise their name, uh, said it's kind of a family thing. Going to college wasn't exactly a choice. It was more of a, I mean, I wanted to go to college, but it was like, no, you're going to college kind of deal. And so this young man said, hey, Dr. Hines, this is the expectation. It was really about not uh, if you're going, it's where you're going. And the point is, he was going to the place that his parents made sure that he had the most financial aid. Pre-college primers uh, from uh, Jaquana. We'll talk about Jaquana White in just a second. But pre-college primers are Black men who were introduced to college and were primed uh, for college with deciding before deciding to in, attend or enroll. So they were either in summer enrichment programs. We have some STEM programs that we have students in. Uh, I know I have my son in uh, some of these STEM programs. They had connections to college resources before they came. So normally they will come on something like a preview day and maybe connected to say some place like the Black Student Union or the African American uh, Cultural Center. And one of the other kickers, which is another big uh, determinant of whether Black men not only go to college, but stay in college, is that they have enough financial aid to be able to pay for their tuition and board. So that's another thing that we, at one, I, could, I could do a three hour lecture on that, uh, that we could talk about in terms of having enough financial resources to be able to finish college. So Jaquana said, I got an invitation from a summer bridge program I attended something called Bridge the summer before coming into NU. That, that's the uh, 
the name of the uh, university. It was a program for minorities in engineering where we basically took all core classes I'm taking now to get ready and to kind of get a feel for what the semester is going to look like. It was a five-week program where we stayed here at NU. It did cost money, but if you worked hard, you got the reward for the that at the end. So that is something that I was able to experience and definitely is helping me now and making college way easier. So they were taking some of those introductory STEM courses that we talk about now in the summer. They had peer tutors. They actually had uh, uh, professors who would work with them one-on-one -on -one in the dormitory as well, but they actually got to explore the college campus and it wasn't a rush. It was the summertime. You're able to see what college is like, the career center, uh, where's the math center? It was called the Q Center back then. Where's the writing center? Your freshman year, you're trying to fly a plane and you're building it at the same time. So I got to find all these resources. I got to make sure I get to class on time. I got to figure out how to study as well. Oh, I got all this free time. Let me play Nintendo Switch. My son has a Switch. So that's <laughs> kind of what we're, but not really understanding that they have to take the time and be disciplined and manage their time to study to be uh, successful. Social, educational, and social empowerment. So educational and social empowerment were those pre-college opportunities and college opportunities that they got to engage in on campus. So some of our students, as soon as they got here freshman year, they were able to get into leadership, into different organizations, uh, whether it was auxiliary or whether it was in a dorm. We had even some students that were running for student government in their freshman year because they got to know other individuals. And then they got to know other black males and other students on campus. So they formed bonds, a brotherhood, which was like, hey, all right, I think I like this place. Not only am I gonna attend, I wanna stay. So Michael Jackson actually said, I go to this thing called supplemental instruction. So supplemental instruction is really just uh, an additional study session for a class, but it's really in a formalized setting with maybe a tutor or a postdoc uh, specifically for classes where students are having issues. It's almost every day of the week. It's for my chemistry class, and it's ideally students who pass the class and understand it. They reteach the class to other students, so it's not really they're teaching it a different way than their professor would teach it. It's more so making it understandable for students. I want to talk about this other study quickly as well. So as you notice, some of the things that have helped students is making sure that the parents are not only involved, but the parents are being supportive, being able to know and understand all the resources that are on campus, and also being able to be engaged and be invested in the institution. So it's one thing to say, oh, the institution is invested in you, but if we want to retain Black males, let's make sure that they feel like they can have an investment in the state in the college as well. So this uh, study was actually about uh, graduate students who we wanted to look at who decided to go into uh, graduate school for engineering. So one of my passions is how do we ensure that we get more black males into the engineering pipeline? So my, in career development, I'm always saying, you know, we, we have students who are going into STEM, but are they staying in the STEM because they got a degree? That's another lecture too. But also, what are the, what are the students who are going into grad school and even in the prof, uh, professoriate getting engineering degrees what made them choose to want to go into academia? What made them choose to get into graduate school? So some of this programming, some of the information that we are getting, we can actually use at the undergraduate level and even in K-12 to continue to develop STEM identity. So this one is free too as well. If you all want to um, take a look at this article, I can send it to you. So these are our findings. But for the findings, just for today, I'm going to talk about the hurdles and obstacles, that theme, and then the sub theme of the net, uh, negative racialized experiences. One of the things that I want to do is make sure that you all understand just opposing the positive experiences of Black males. What are some of the negative experiences that Black men have on campus and even in their programs? So although this is, again, limited to graduate students and it's a qualitative study, I guarantee you, you could ask some of the Black men here on campus today, have they had these experiences or felt these type of emotions mm -hmm. and feelings? So for hurdles and obstacles, 
Ben actually talked about how he was having difficulty uh, with his advisors and he reflected on it. And what he said was, but my advisor just made me feel very, very insecure to the point where I would get to like the board, the whiteboard, and he would make me work out problems on the whiteboard and I would just start shaking. Because, you know, every time you get something wrong, he's like, why would you do, why would you do it like that? Why would you think that's okay to do? And being a young grad student that I was like, like, is this what everybody else is going through? So again, think back to if you're being, if you're shaming black men, I'm going to walk out of the classroom. Remember what I, I gave you that case? Or I'm going to drop the class. Or I'm out. I'm not going to do STEM. Is, is this what STEM is like? And I've worked with a lot of STEM professors and is sitting in meetings. And I've even heard some of them challenge the intellect of some of our Black students and, and particularly Black males. And so I'm sitting back like, I can't believe we all have PhDs. And you're asking, are Black students smart enough to be in STEM? <laughs> so it, it blew my mind. So we had to have um, an educational talk about, well, we're always blaming the student, but what about the institutions? We don't necessarily talk about the school districts that they come from. So they may be top 20, top 10% of their class, but did they have those college readiness classes? You all know some schools may not even have AP, IB, or honors courses. So they did what they could to be able to be successful. So did their parents. So if they're coming to our institution, then it becomes our responsibility to ensure that we are helping black males be successful. So if that means a little more tutoring, let's get it for them. That means that they have to understand how to navigate certain spaces, let's do that as well. So with that being said, these are things that we have to challenge ourselves when we're engaging and interacting with black males, particularly if they're showing that there's a problem or an issue. A negative racialized experience. Uh, David and Mr. NSU really talked about some of the experiences that they have had um, being able to come to an uh, institution and working with uh, a particular faculty member. And so David said, this faculty's research interests fit mine, but he tells you, oh, I don't have funding right now, but he has a Chinese student next week, uh, next week or two. So this is how the issue of prejudice, you know, with the black race, we are just highly suppressed, marginalized and oppressed. It, it just, you know, and cost across all areas, you know, even in the field, you know, even just in the graduate school, you see all of this happening. And also with uh, Mr. NSU, he also talked about uh, his response on hearing a faculty member talk about a black, school, black student uh, kind of a distance away. He said about a black person, I don't like the way they dress and the way they speak, the way they talk. I just don't like it. I'm like, I mean, we're going to wear suits to school every day, Mr. NSU. So these are some of the conversations that do happen between faculty and K-12 educators. And these are things that will turn Black males off. And then again, that comes back to investment. If my teacher, my faculty have these expectations of me, why in the world am I going to be in education? Why in the world am I going to subject myself to some of these issues? And so with that being said, part of what we have to do is think about how is it that we could best help Black males thrive and succeed? I know we're here uh, in a higher education setting. Normally, if we had a few more K-12 educators, I would have added some of those recommendations in here as well. So I have those if you want those as well. Uh, one of the things that we can all do, even as a faculty member, and I, and I did it, and I've worked with advisors, helping them uh, create academic and career plans. plans. So all those students have program and plan of studies, let's make sure that we're sticking to it. And not only that, let's go even further. So even with the students I've worked with, they wanted to be an engineer, but I've noticed that their advisor gave them 15 credit hours of all heavy STEM classes in their first year as a college student. That is kind of a, a nightmare. So how do we balance out their coursework so that they're taking some of their gen ed they may be taking an elective and then taking maybe one or two STEM courses. We want them to thrive and succeed. So these are things that we have to think about, just those little things to make sure that they're balanced. So I've had a student that actually took those classes, all STEM. He had a 1.5 uh, 
uh, no, yeah, 1.8 GPA. Uh, and what we did uh, the spring semester is we recalibrated the schedule. I sat down with them as a faculty director and then said, hey, we need to take this course, you take this course, you take that course. So once we balanced it, he came out with over 3.0 and now today he's actually in a physician assistant school. So those are things, it wasn't that he wasn't bright or smart and engaged, it's really how do we help them manage the coursework and the load that they, they have. So these are little tweaks that we have to think about. We can apply this to every student as well. Sometimes we think about that like, oh, they don't really are interested in STEM. Well, we may have to balance out their courses so they're not being stressed out by taking a lot of STEM courses. Also involving parents in the process. I know some programs do have uh, days that they bring parents here or they bring parents at the beginning of the semester. I've done that as well. Been able to talk to them about what goes on on campus, what the expectations are in this particular learning community or program. Been able to have them even interact with uh, campus police. I mean, trying to uh, make sure that I diffuse any type of concerns and being able to uh, make sure that uh, I was talking to parents about things that were going on, not about grades. I know it's a, that's FERPA, but being able to make sure that this is what is happening while your son is in school and make sure that, you know, you talk to your son about things that are happening in college. I know it's a different world, so parents are more involved as probably my parents were when <laughs> I was in college about 20-something odd years ago. I was expected to come home with a diploma, and that's how my mom knew that I graduated from college. The other part is, how do we engage our counselors more? Clinical mental health, our career counselors here, if we're on campus, uh, also our school counselors to identify and target some of these issues that may be affecting Black men, but also ensuring that they're taking the right courses to be prepared for any type of post-secondary opportunity that they choose. The same here, how do we engage more Black men into the career center so that they are uh, connecting their major or their professional goals with what's happening on the job market so that once they graduate or even before they graduate, they're entering the job market and then uh, hitting those goals. And also the other thing that we sometimes forget to do, and I've done this before myself, how do we incorporate Black men or Black males as collaborators and what we want to do in different initiatives? Their voice is what matters the most. So we may be thinking, oh, this program is working. No, Dr. Hines, actually, if we do this, this will be more helpful. I had to learn um, that a lot of students look at YouTube for information. And I, I think I was just showing them old videos like, no, Dr. Hines, you need to look at YouTube and use this as a format. I bet you if you get your messages on YouTube, the students will start looking at it. And I started doing that and they started engaging them more. Excuse me. Also, uh, providing them resources to help them navigate the gateway courses. One of the things uh, I've always been a, a fan of is looking at what HBCUs do, um, having more of a, a community and family environment, especially when it comes to STEM, rather than a weed out environment, making sure that they have the support there and ensuring that if students really want to do STEM, how do we give them the resources to be successful? Or on the flip side, with my school counselor hat on, if they're not uh, as good at a particular major in STEM, what are the options out there that, that, uh, that they can engage in that, that will help them be able to still stay in STEM, but also be successful uh, in college? Uh, utilize a career center. The other biggest piece is how do we have high expectations of Black men? So again, going back to we want this X, this X uh, team to win the Super Bowl, this X team to win the NBA. So we celebrate them. We have high expectations to do well. How do we translate these expectations into the classroom? Well, I want Eric to do well. So I'm going to do everything in my power to ensure that he's getting the resources he needs or he's connected with students who know how, who are doing well in the classes. And also examining our bias and beliefs, right? So Get one good example, I could be standing in the elevator, elevator and I work at home. So I'm, I'm usually in sweats and a t-shirt. My colleague and friend, Brad, Brad who, who's also a professor here, he'll see me in the neighborhood looking the same way. And so sometimes some people will look at me, I like, what is this guy doing? Is there a clutch, something, <laughs> a purse or something when I'm walking? I've seen it a couple of times. And so what is that about? What triggers you to want to clutch that purse? 
Is there something that is happening in your life personally? Is that something that has happened on TV? So we're always having to examine what is it that is not making us uh, be trustworthy or even be comfortable around Black men. And also speak out against anti-Black uh, racism. Some of uh, A lot of us in here would probably say in our mind, I'm not racist, I'm not biased. But we may have encountered somebody who was saying something inappropriate. Do we have the courage to speak out against it? No, that's not right. No, you shouldn't be saying that. That's not appropriate to talk about this student in that manner. So we have to be advocates for our students. And that means speaking up even in uncomfortable situations. The last thing I wanna do for the sake of time uh, is using data to defend and support creating and sustaining programs. If you go back to the data, nobody can refute that. We could say, well, 39% is the graduation rate for black men. Why aren't we doing something about this in our particular institution if the graduation rate is at? Why aren't we doing some type of program programming? And that doesn't mean that it has to be exclusively for black males. It could be for anybody who wants to come in and support black men. So that's the other thing that we want to talk about as well, is that there, there could be allies, there could be advocates that can come in and engage in the same programming or be in that programming and do some of that phenomenal work. So that, that's one thing that I always try to talk to individuals about when they are nervous about that. Go back to the data, talk about the data, talk about the evidence. A lot of us are researchers in here. We got to have data to support the work that we're doing. And so that could be an, our invention angel. And so with that being said, I thank you. Is there any questions? I saw on your slides a couple of places where you identified skill set um, lacking soft skill, and then other places that uh, on a different slide we said supporting uh, black male in higher ed is also training or providing um, education support for mm -hmm. developing soft skills. Can you give a couple of examples of what you're referring to in the soft skills? Uh, well, I think some, some of our students don't know how to interact with faculty. So we sit, uh, I used to sit with some of our students and say, hey, these are the questions you can ask. Uh, some of them may not know how to, I don't want to say challenge is the wrong word. So if we have a, a grade that we don't agree with, sometimes we tend to go off on our faculty members, which I don't condone <laughs> at all. So some of those soft skills are, hot. okay, so Dr. Such and Such, I see that I got this grade. What is it that I've done wrong and what can I do to improve the grade? This diffuses the situation. And nine times out of 10, that can help you get your grade change unless the faculty member doesn't want to do that, want to change it. Uh, some students have issues with interview skills, uh, being able to talk uh, during interviews. So we would do that, uh, helping them train. So I think it's just little tweaks that some of the students don't have, don't come with the cultural and social capital to come in to automatically know these things. We've helped students uh, even in conjunction with the Career Center uh, develop their um, resumes as well, being able to do some of that technical writing even at a sophomore uh, first and second year level so that they're able to get those internships. So that's what I mean, being supportive. So I think so some of it comes with, and as a school counselor, we're taught to care and have empathy and a lot of that is really how do we be empathic to our students and ensuring that these young men know that we're here for them to be successful. I mean, we, we have empathy, but we also have accountability. So we want to make sure that they get the work done and that they learn it and being able to graduate, but also if there are issues that come up, empathize and being able to make adjustments to help them be successful. Yes, ma'am. A little bit about the transition from undergraduate to graduate education. Mm -hmm. and I'm you know, um, there are maybe some interventions we could have to yes. really make that link better. I think yes. I've heard few, but I'm kind of wondering if there are any existing strategies that are specifically about trying to promote um, that that bridge more effectively. That a, do we have any like that at SSU? Um, and b, is it is it do we do we know whether um, black men are more likely to go into graduate education if they're encouraged at their undergraduate institution, like is there a place for a person going elsewhere? Um, That's 
Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I, I think that, that we can cultivate it. So I know the care program, they have a so a, a summer program. And so I know that they have certain criteria for students that come in over the summer. So uh, I know that's one example of uh, a bridge program or an enrichment program. I know uh, my colleague, Dr. James Moore, who is actually uh, a professor at The Ohio State University and the uh, executive director of the Todd Bell uh, Anthony Center on the African American Male, they have what is called the Early Arrival Program. And so they have their Black males come in about three days before, and they engage with different professors. They talk with individuals in financial aid. They do a lot of uh, community building. Uh, they're able to understand and explore the campus, buy their books, see what their dorms are. And so that really gives them exposure kind of before the semester starts so that they can get uh, some footing. So that is an example. I'm always an advocate of any type of bridge program, whether it's sponsored or, uh, or not sponsored in terms of tuition, so that students can come in, especially first year students, can come in and get some footing to be successful. And in terms of the graduate school process, we actually uh, experimented um, when I was over the learning community, we would uh, do a study. We had a study abroad component where we would go to Bahia, Brazil to study the Afro-Brazilian culture and the disparities in education and compared to the US. And so we used that time actually, that actually two ways, to talk about graduate, stu stu uh, graduate school with all of our students, particularly uh, those who are, were interested in doing more than pursuing an undergraduate degree. Uh, we also had in our learning community, it was called first year experience classes. So I know they have first year courses here, those one credit courses to get students adjusted and acclimated or something that they're interested in a particular topic. We had a course in that learning community that focused on graduate school preparation in their second year. So they will actually talk about grad school. I had researchers come in, uh, not only just grad school, but also uh, professional schools. So we had the law school dean come in at one point. We had individuals from the medical school come in. We had a panel full of med school students, graduate school student, uh, graduate school students, and then the young men actually were able to relate and connect and say, hey, well, these guys were in the same shoes that I was in, you know, whether they were academically talented in the beginning or they became academically talented toward the end and being able to see uh, that they could themselves can be in those same shoes. So, yeah, there are ways of actually doing it. And in fact, some of the guys that I've actually engaged and had in the community, uh, probably half of them are. They either have their graduate education or they're pursuing their graduate education uh, right now. So I have a few of, a few guys in med school right now. I have one guy who is actually getting his uh, PhD uh, in engineering. And some of them went to the world of work. They actually got their career. So yes, there are ways to do it and examples of doing it. But yeah, having that conversation, it's kind of like we would say this, uh, we did a, a, a parent training on college planning. The more we have these conversations around going to college, financial aid, the more we demystify it, right? So it doesn't get scared. The more we talk about how to fill out the FAFSA form, uh, my wife uh, is, uh, is a former school counselor too. She could talk about these things that they are day in and day out. The more that the FAFSA becomes easier. So the more we talk about these things earlier from GRE to GMAT to, okay, maybe you should do an internship before you go to grad school. These things become easier. So a lot of the guys ended up getting, uh, particularly my guys in engineering, going and getting a lab, uh, getting into a lab for an assistantship their senior year and going straight to a PhD program in whatever engineering discipline that we're in. And it also helps to, I think the other thing I want to, and, and I'll end on this, the other thing that helps to doing programming for Black males on a, a, a college institution, it's always good to be connected with the different units across campus, the provost's office, the uh, office of uh, safety, uh, being able to come college ed, the med school. So I had kind of partners in every college being able to have these conversations and how we can best move the pipeline forward. And once I use the data, you can kind of see some of the anxiousness about why are we helping this group? Why are we doing this for this population? kind of come down and say, hey, we need to do a better job of getting all our students 
through the pipeline. And I'm finished, Marty. Thank you. <laughs>